Well, good morning, everybody. I'm excited to be with you guys. <clears throat> I wanted to start off with a favorite story of mine that's a little embarrassing for me. Uh, when I was 14 years old, I was asked to be uh, in, or I wanted to be in my sister's wedding. She got engaged uh, right around I was 14. She's a lot older than me, about eight years. So I was really excited about this opportunity. And of course, being very selfless, the first thing that I went to when she got engaged was, ooh, what do I get to do in the wedding? Uh, and so I kind of hounded in, and I settled on this one job, this one role of chief usher. Now, as I understand it, that's not something that's common in American weddings. So if you guys don't know what a chief usher is, then you are in the exact same boat I was in when I was 14 years old. I just looked up a whole bunch of roles. That one sounded like I might be able to get it. I knew I wasn't going to be best man, so uh, I went for chief usher. It sounded great. So I started this campaign to convince my sister that I should be the chief usher. And just to kind of give you some context, I wanted to give you a picture of what I looked like when I was 14 years old. There we go. There we go. <clears throat> so you might be able to understand why my sister might have been a little bit hesitant to put this chopstick eating loon in her wedding. Uh, but I hounded her. I wanted this. So I went after it. And I kind of wrestled that down. And after a few months, she came to me. She handed me an envelope. And inside was an invitation to be the chief usher. So I was, I was very happy. Uh, the resume that I'd created and handed her must have paid off. Uh, so I uh, went to the wedding day. It's wedding day. I finally get into this position, and I find out what a chief usher actually does. A chief usher is responsible for making sure that all the people in the wedding party are where they need to be, uh, all the guests are where they need to be, that everyone who has a role on the usher's team, that they're where they need to be. And I even needed to make sure I knew where the rings were that had to get handed in at, uh, at the vows. So this instantly was a lot more intimidating than I thought it was. I thought I would just get to kick out wedding crashes or something like that. But it turns out that this was actually a really important job, something that was very difficult. And I, as a 14-year-old, really was not qualified to do. Uh, but there I found myself. I even had to uh, find someone to take me home because the rings actually were forgotten. So it was, it was like a classic movie experience. Everything that I should have not had to do, I ended up having to do. Uh, but nevertheless, there I was. I found myself in this position I was really excited for, but totally unqualified for, and realizing that I didn't know what I was doing at all. And I look back on that story now, and it reminds me about the relationship between grace and calling. We are in this series, Uncomfortable Grace, and we've been looking at what grace is. And, and one of the favorite things I've heard so far is from Pastor Jeff on the first week. He said that grace is that which we barely understand, but desperately need. Grace is that which we barely understand, but desperately need. And what he means by that is that grace is a topic in Christianity that we kind of look at on occasion, that we wrestle through, we think about, especially when we think about coming to know God. But we don't really understand how important it is. We tend to forget it very quickly. And you see, grace is not just important for coming to know God and to being saved and to uh, getting redeemed. Grace is important to the whole Christian life. There is no Christian life apart from grace. Grace is the entire foundation on which everything in our relationship with God is built. So I want to look at today, not just at the relationship to being grace and us being saved, but looking at what grace has to do with our calling, what God has asked us to do. So I want to look at a letter, 2 Timothy, because I think that this letter, letter has got some really interesting, important encouragements for us to think about this idea, to think about the relationship between grace and calling. So if you would, and you have your Bibles, would you guys read with me in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. This is what it says. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been made manifest through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me 
in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So this letter, 2 Timothy, was written by the Apostle Paul. We know Paul was a very interesting man. He was saved in the book of Acts. We see how he came to know Jesus. He was on the road on his way to persecute Christians. Jesus appears before him, knocks him off his horse, and calls him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And after that, Paul is a completely changed man. He goes from being Saul to Paul, and then he starts leading the church. He starts leading the campaign to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, to people outside of the Jewish people. And along his journeys in the book of Acts, we also see that he meets a man named Timothy. And Timothy is kind of a young Christian, someone who Paul meets and and leads to know Jesus, who shows that he's actually got some really good skills. He's got uh, some talent and some giftings to be able to preach. So Paul decides to disciple him and mentor him. And eventually Timothy becomes the leader in a church. He becomes one of the most important leaders in the church. And actually Paul talks about him quite a lot. And there's a number of letters in the New Testament that Paul writes to Timothy. In this particular letter, Paul is writing from prison. It's towards the end of Paul's life. He has been preaching this gospel, and eventually, because people were not very happy with this message and what it meant, they put Paul in prison. And not only that, Paul knows that he is probably going to be executed because of the preaching of the gospel. He sat in in prison, and as he writes this letter later on, he references how he understands that God is going to ask him to give up his life for the gospel. And he writes this to Timothy because he knows Timothy is heading for the exact same place. Because just like Paul, Timothy is called to preach the gospel, to be a teacher, to be a leader in a church. And Paul knows that around about this time when Timothy sees his mentor and his friends going to prison for the gospel and getting executed for the gospel, Paul knows Timothy is going to be feeling some anxiety. He's going to be struggling with his calling, knowing that it's actually a very, very difficult calling. A calling on some occasions to suffer. For the sake of the gospel. So he writes this letter, and in that text that we just read, we see an encouragement from Paul to Timothy about how to live out his calling, about how to endure in this calling that turns out to be quite difficult. And he gives him three reminders. He gives him a reminder about the God that calls, the God that qualifies, and then the God that sustains. And these three reminders serve as an encouragement to Timothy to persevere, to be who he was called to be, to live out the calling on his life. But not only that, it's a lesson to us today. It's a lesson for us in how to understand how God sustains us, how God prepares us for what he's called us to do, and what that is in the first place. So let's look at the first reminder that he's got, the God that calls. When I first got out of university, I started working on a farm, I had a really good friend, and his family was trying to start up a farm in Texas, uh, and he needed some hands around the farm to help get things started. He needed someone to help him get everything planted and keep things moving, and so he brought me on as his friend to help him out. Uh, And at the time, I didn't really want to be a farmer. I'd never known anything about farming, but I thought this would be a really cool opportunity because I knew I wanted to go into ministry one day, and and what's better for some eventual sermon analogies than working on a farm? So I was like, I'm I'm in. I'll take this. This will be helpful. Uh, So I signed up, and to begin with, it was really a very interesting job. It was a lot of fun getting to do things I'd never done before, uh, getting to do some really hard work that was really rewarding. But then the Texas summer hit, Uh, and if you've been to Texas, you know it gets crazy hot in the summers, uh, and it gets very, very humid. And I'm out there working at the beginning of the summer, and I'm trying to go through these rows, make my way through everything I had to get done, and I I smell something, and it it smells a little weird, and I realize my flesh is actually cooking in the Texas heat, that I am being baked alive. And very quickly, I start to think, I I don't know if I'm into this job anymore. This is starting to get a little uncomfortable and unpleasant. You know, I I dreamed that I would just be getting salmon analogies, but this is actually now getting kind of gross. And so I didn't know what I wanted to do about this. And in those moments, if I wanted to persevere in that job, I had to remember why I got there. Why did I end up doing what I was doing? What was I there to do? And that's very similar to this situation because Paul is coming to Timothy and he's trying to remind him about why he is where he is. This is what he says to him at the beginning of our passage in verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. 
See, as I said, Timothy was called to do exactly what Paul was called to do. He was a teacher in a church. He was a leader in a church. He was preaching the gospel. And right about now, Paul knows he's probably getting anxious. This is not looking as exciting as it may have at the beginning. There's starting to be a considerable opposition to the gospel. The Jewish leaders of the day were getting more and more hostile. Paul himself is evidence to the fact that people were getting more and more violent towards the church. And things were getting a little ugly. And so he knows probably what Timothy's dealing with as a leader of a church is he's dealing maybe with some shame, with some anxiety, with some struggle about this message because it's turning out to be costly. And so he gives him this message. He says, fan into flame your gift, Timothy. The gift that you've got when we started this out, when I called you, when you were saved by God, use your gifts. Don't be ashamed of this message, he tells Timothy. Don't be ashamed, but do this. Move forward in this calling. Now we might listen to this and we think about Timothy and we struggle initially to kind of see how this is relevant to us because most of us are not leaders in a church. Most of us are not missionaries to a far off country. Most of us are not going to be in the position exactly like Timothy was. But there is at least one thing that we all share in common with Timothy in this text. There's at least one thing that we know we have that he had as well, and that's a call to preach the gospel. Every single one of us, everyone who has come to know Jesus, everyone who calls him their Lord is preached, is called to preach the gospel. That is what our calling is to do as Christians, is to make known who God is and what he's done. To make known the news, the good news, of everything that Jesus accomplished in his life for our sake and for others' sakes. And we're all of us called to do that. Now, it can get a little bit difficult doing that because even though we might not necessarily end up in chains and in prison like Paul did, to preach the gospel in our culture and in our time can be a difficult thing. It can be a little bit embarrassing as culture starts to move more and more away from the the values that it used to have. Christianity is not something that's as accepted as it once was. To be a Christian, you instantly set yourself out from a crowd. I know even in my generation, as people my age come up and grow up in the church, it's getting more and more difficult to hold on to your beliefs, to have a solid grounding in faith, because the world constantly is challenging the view of the gospel, the message of the gospel. But if if we really read the Bible, we shouldn't be surprised that that happens. We shouldn't be surprised that society and culture and, and the world reacts this way to the message of the gospel. Because the message of the gospel has always been offensive. It's always been something that challenges people and makes people struggle. This is what Paul said in another one of his letters, in the letter to uh, Rome, in Romans uh, chapter 9. He says, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Paul is quoting a prophecy from earlier in the Bible, and what he's saying is that the message of the gospel, who Jesus is and what he's done, that message is a stone of stumbling, and it's a rock of offense. He's saying this message about who Jesus is and what he's doing. People don't like it. It's going to cause them to struggle when they hear it because the gospel challenges everything they think about themselves, about others, and most importantly, about God. It challenges their worldviews. It challenges what they think is most valuable, what they think is most important, the way that they should react to people around them. And things haven't changed. The gospel still challenges things in our culture and in our world. It challenges us to rethink about what we think of God like, how we see him, what we think about Jesus. But we need to pay attention to the last little bit of that verse I just said. That though it is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, what Paul also says is that whoever trusts in it will not be put to shame. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. See, the message of gospel, of the gospel, even though it can be a stone of stumbling, even though it can be a rock of offense to the people around us, the message of the gospel liberates people from shame, from condemnation. Ultimately, it brings them from death to life. Now, do you believe that that's what the gospel is this morning? Most of you come to church every week and we talk about this same message again and again. We probably overuse the word gospel again and again because of how much we believe this message is worth because of how important we see it is. But do you, when you hear it every week, do you believe that this message liberates people from shame? 
Is this message something that you're ashamed about? Is, is what it's about something that you struggle with, that maybe it's a stone of stumbling to you or a rock of offense to you? Or is it something that you treasure, something that you feel has lifted you out of the burdens in your life? Because that's what the message of the gospel is. We might feel like it's difficult, but if we are honest with ourselves and if we look into this message, we see that it is a message of love from God. That's why it's called the gospel, because it is good news. It's not a message about condemnation. It's not a message about people having to do better. It's a message about what God has done for us because he loves us so much. And that's also why you are called to preach the gospel, because God loves people so much. God loves people so much that he called you to preach the gospel to them because he wants them to know what you know. He wants them to find what you have found. God wants to liberate people from burdens. He wants to rescue them from slavery. He wants to bring them into his kingdom to give them joy. That is good news. But do we believe that? The Bible says it's good news, but we need to understand that it is. We need to start believing that it is. Just like Timothy was encouraged not to be ashamed, we need to be deciding as a church family, as Christians, as the people of God, that we are not ashamed of this message, that we think it's beautiful, that we think it's good news for people, that it brings joy to people. We need to remember that we have been called to do this because God loves people, that he cares about people. The second reminder that Paul's got for Timothy in this passage is the reminder about the God that qualifies. He says in verse 9, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Uh, My last job before this one, I worked in a university, uh, a DeVry University, and I was an academic advisor. I tend to move around a lot. I went from farming to university. Uh, But it was was an interesting shift. And one thing that I felt in this job in particular uh, was a lot of stress about whether or not I was going to get to keep my job. The reason for that was that DeVry University is a for-profit institution, so the way that it moves is that they, they pay for everything, they pay for their employees by admission. So if admission drops, then the amount in their budget drops, and the amount they have to, to kind of expend on their, con- on their company and keep things running goes down as well. So if there was a difficult semester and there wasn't as many enrollments, then they had to try and find an area to cut money. And if you work in business, you know one of the easiest places to try and cut expenditure is in employees because they take up most of the money. Having to pay someone takes up most of the money. And so there would be several seasons when I worked at DeVry uh, over the course of a couple of years where I saw many people let go. And that was a difficult thing to watch. Maybe you have been in a situation where either yourself or someone else you know and care about has been in that place where they have been let go. And in those moments, what you think when you struggle through that is you think about, was I not doing the best job? Why did they let me go as opposed to someone else? Was it something about me that wasn't showing that I was valuable enough, that I was worth the money I was being paid? And even if you don't get cut, I managed to stay around, but every time I went to my job, I thought, man, I need to do better. I need to make sure I don't end up on someone's radar and get let go. I need to work harder. I need to be better. And that was an immensely stressful and and difficult thing to live under, to go to your job feeling like at any moment you might lose it, especially when you've got a wife and two kids at home and you know that you've got to provide for them. But really the joy of being a Christian and being in God's kingdom is that God's kingdom doesn't work anything like that. Even though we live in a world that again and again reinforces this message of what you get in life is about what you put into it. The value on your life is about how hard you work and how much you achieve and the legacy that you build for you and yours. The gospel and the message of God's kingdom is that you are here and you are brought in by grace, by God's love. Paul says to Timothy in this passage, he says, you've been called not because of your works, Timothy, but because of God's purpose and grace. He said, Timothy, don't ever forget that you are here and that God has called you, not because you were a great teacher, not because you were eloquent, not because you were smart, not because you stood out from the rest of the crowd. He called you because of his grace. Ultimately, God called Timothy and calls us and calls Paul and calls everyone who has ever been called in the Bible, not because he needs us, but because he loves us. God calls you not because he needs you or wants to exploit you in any way. It's because he loves you. There is nothing more to it than that. He does not bring you in because you are going to provide something for him. He brings you in because he loves you and wants you to be a part of what he is doing in eternity, in the world. 
I think that that's incredible news. I think that's incredible that we are part of something when we come to know God that isn't based on how much we put in. That there will never be a day in the kingdom of God where someone is retired because they weren't good enough. That someone is let go because they weren't smart enough. They couldn't keep up with everybody else. God is not comparing you to anybody next to you. which is inc- I don't know about you, but that's incredible news for me. I would feel incredibly under pressure if I knew that God was judging me by the person next to me, but he doesn't. That's not how his kingdom works. He wants me and he brought me in because of his love and his grace, not because I have something to offer him. But that doesn't just mean that. It means actually that you are the best person to preach the gospel to everyone in your sphere of influence because you are qualified to do it by God's grace, not by your works. So when we think about preaching the gospel, especially uh, as someone who's in a regular job, and in a secular environment most of the time, we think, well, I'm not holy enough. My life isn't necessarily something that proclaims God in the way that it should. And so people will think I'm a hypocrite if I try and preach this message. If I try and talk about Jesus, they'll think I'm a hypocrite. Or maybe we go and we think, well, I'm not as smart as as this guy over here. You know, I'm not as eloquent as, as some of my other friends who preach the gospel. So I don't think people will get it. I think I'll do a terrible job. I'll misrepresent Jesus when I try and talk about him. But the great news about this idea of being called by grace is that because grace has qualified you, there is never a day, there is never a not enough that will make God revoke your calling. He will never cast you to the side because you are not enough in one area or another. You are valuable to him and he will call you and will use you because of his grace. He will qualify you for everything he's called you to do. That's why here at this church we say every week, that we want to be a church, church where people experience grace, grow in their faith, and impact people right where they are. Because we believe that because of the gospel, everyone who sits in a pew in this church is qualified to preach the gospel to the people around them. Because of God's grace, you are the very best person to tell your co-workers, to tell your family, to tell your friends about who Jesus is and what he's done. There is no one role that is better than another. A terrible mistake that we might make is to think that only people in church in full-time ministry are best equipped to tell people about Jesus. I mean, that's so wrong that it's, it's almost the antithesis of what's true. The, the truth is, is that you guys are God's intention to preach the gospel, to get the message out. The message of the gospel shouldn't just be within the four walls of a church. It should be in businesses. It should be in hospitals. It should be in homes. No matter what you do, you have been called to preach the gospel and you are totally qualified to do it because of God's grace, because of his purpose and his grace, his love for people like you. When I started working here about two months ago full-time, I'd worked here on and off, kind of on a volunteer doing things, and some of you know I did a residency last year. But when I came on full-time, I started getting to spend more and more time with people like Jeff and Brian and Sterling. Uh, I got to spend a lot more time in student ministries with people like Tom and Gretchen, who are the directors of the high school ministry. And I very quickly started comparing myself to them because I noticed how clever they were, how really gifted they were. I looked at people like Jeff and Brian and Sterling and thought, well, wow, they are really good at what they do. The way that they preach, the way that they love their families, the way that they get done what they need to get done, it's just better than me. And I look at people like Tom and Gretchen and think, well, they're way better with students than I am. They've just got much better ideas. They're more creative. And I, I could go through all these lists and I started to think exactly as I mentioned ago, well, maybe I'm not enough this to be able to do what God's called me to do. Maybe I'm not enough this. But I need to remember in those moments, God is not looking at me and the person next to me and thinking anything about how I need to be better. He's thinking, I called you, Andrew, by my grace and by my purpose and by my love. That is why you are where you are. And that is why you are the best person to do what I've called you to do. And friends, that is the same thing that he's saying to you this morning. No matter where you are, no matter what job you do, no matter who is around you and how impressive they are, God says to you that I have called you to preach the gospel. I've called you to do it because you have been qualified by my grace. The last reminder that Paul has got for Timothy is about the God that sustains. He says in verses 12 and 14, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. One of my favorite things about the Bible, about the word of God, is that it is extremely honest with us. The Bible is not 
uh, something that tries to get us into a scheme, something that tries to trick us at the start and then turns the table on us when we're inside. It tells us up front what you can expect if you want to follow Jesus, that there is a cost to following Jesus, that there is a challenge to preaching this message and, and following this God. And I love that it's honest. But it's not just honest with us. It's got a better encouragement than that. It tells us that when we are called to do this, we will not be called to do it alone. One of my favorite moments from Pastor Brian's sermon a couple of weeks ago was when he started telling us about uh, the message of the Bible and how there was different characters in the Bible and, and different things that, gone on, that went on in their stories. People like Joseph and all the difficult things that happened to him. People like Moses and how he started off his story. And he wasn't eloquent. He was, he was a murderer. He tells us about people like David who was a great king, but then he made a lot of mistakes. But every time he told us one of those stories, he said, but God. He said Joseph had all these horrible things to hap happening to him, but God. And Moses wasn't eloquent enough to be a leader, but God. And David was a great king, but he made some mistakes, and then he made a mess of everything that he was called to do, but God. Those are some of the best two words that you can hear in your life, but God, because that's exactly how he has worked throughout all of history. That's how he works today. That when we are not enough, when we don't bring to the table what needs to be there, God brings it for us. What Paul tells him in this passage is that just as he started this and said, don't be ashamed, Timothy, he says, Timothy, I am not ashamed, and I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed. Think about what I've taught you. He says, follow the pattern of the words that I told you, Timothy. By the Holy Spirit, guard what's been entrusted to you. He doesn't say, Timothy, guard this calling and get this calling done by your cleverness and your eloquence. He says, by the Holy Spirit. Our Christian life does not run on our endurance and our skill. It runs on the Holy Spirit. Your ability to get done what God has called you to do is done through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Christian life without the Holy Spirit is like a car without gas. It's not going to run anywhere. It's not going to move anywhere. If we try to do this, if we try and live out our calling without the God who sustains the God that lives within us, then we're not going to go anywhere and we're going to start to feel very condemned, very crushed, and we're going to be worn down and discouraged. Because if we try to make it work on our own grit and our own strength, it will not move. Friends, what the people around you need in order to see the gospel is for you not only to preach the gospel to them, but to preach the gospel to yourself. To remind yourself of whom it is that you have believed in. To remember the sound words that you heard when you began learning about who Jesus is. If you call to mind those things, if you remember whom it is that you have believed, what the gospel means for you, then by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will not be ashamed and you will make an impact in the world around you. People will see Jesus alive in you. That's why preaching the gospel is about more than just words. You're not just trying to give them a really clever message. Who you are, the way that you love your friends and family, the way that you serve in your job, all of those things proclaim who Jesus is and what he's done because you do them because of what the gospel's done for you. The why behind everything we should do as Christians is Jesus. One of the psalmists says in Psalm 55, he says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Think of that God, the God who sustains. Cast your burdens on him. Cast your fears and your anxieties on him and he will care for you. He will sustain you. Now that's the three reminders that Paul's got for Timothy, but that's not the end of the story in this text. I want to jump back really quickly to verse 12. This is what he says in verse 12. I'm not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. What is that day? That day is the day when Paul and Timothy's calling is complete, when they have fulfilled everything that God intended for them to do. The day when God returns and reconciles everything back to himself, redeems everything. And on that day, we will all stand before God. We will bring to God to account our lives. And we'll remember the grace that he showed us. And when we trust, not in ourselves and our own works, but in the blood of Jesus and everything that he accomplished on our behalf, then we will stand before God. And God will say a set of words that I don't think I can think of something more beautiful, something that I want to hear more than these words. He'll say to those who have trusted in his son, well done, 
good and faithful servant, enter into your master's rest. That's the words of your creator. That's what he will speak to you when you complete your calling. You will be acknowledged in front of the entire assembly of who, everyone who has ever lived and, and the most important person in the universe will look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's rest. There is rest and reward awaiting those who trust in Jesus, who are not ashamed. That's what Paul wanted to get across to Timothy. Timothy, this is not about today, it's about that day. Your calling is not about the struggle today, it's about the joy that awaits you on that day. So friends, live for that day and you will not be ashamed of the gospel. Would you guys pray with me? Father, I thank you for this incredible message. I thank you for the, the honor of the calling that you have given all of us who trust in you. Lord, you are a great God. You are a God full of grace and compassion. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us enough to, to coming and doing what you did for us. Thank you for loving people around us enough to calling us to preach the gospel to them. Lord, would you remind us of that great calling? Would we live for that day? Would you qualify us for all the things that you bring us to do? And Lord, would you sustain us throughout the challenge of it so that on that day we might hear those precious words and we might look upon the God who had so much grace for us and rejoice for eternity over him. Lord, we pray this in your precious son's name. Amen. Would you stand as